Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. We can dance, we can dance, everybody look at your hands. We can dance, we can dance, everybody's taking the chance. Safe to dance, oh, it's safe to dance. Yes, safe to dance. Hello and welcome to episode 241 of the Situation Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to help improve situational awareness and high-risk decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-stress, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. I'm coming to you today from Fort McMurray, Alberta, Canada, where I'm about halfway through delivering 15 situational awareness programs for oil refinery operators for Syncrude Canada. And I've completed one of the two programs we're doing for the first responders throughout the region. Today's feature segment is a continuation of a series of flashback episodes that I'm running from the early days of the SA Matters show. When I first launched this show back in May of 2014, I had some amazing guests who shared some incredible near-miss stories. The problem is the show was new, really new, and we had not gained much of a followership, at least not the followership like we have today. So I want to give the listeners and the viewers who are not with us back then an opportunity to learn from some of these very powerful stories. Now for those who may be watching this episode on our SA Matters TV YouTube channel. The interview that's coming up is audio only segment because we weren't recording video interviews with our guests back then. Everything on the episode leading up to and following the interview will be video. Before I jump into the feature segment, I'd like to take another moment to mention a special that I'm offering on enrollment in the SA Matters Online Academy. Most first responders have received little or no training on situational awareness and high-risk decision-making. This might be funny if it weren't so tragic. Did you know that issues related to situational awareness and flawed decision-making are among the leading contributing factors in near misses and casualty reports? And many times the issues that lead to the casualty may have been avoided if only the responder or responders had developed and maintained strong situational awareness. I am on a quest to fix this problem, and I really want to help improve your safety and your decision making, and I really want to help you to accomplish the most important goal of all, and that's to go home to the ones who love you. And I hope with all my being that you want the same thing too. If you do, let me help you. I've put together an incredible offer for fire departments that I'm now extending through the end of the year. Your department can enroll up to 100 members for a flat fee of $2,999. Let me give you some perspective on how good of a deal that is. The regular tuition for the academy is $199 a person. Even if your department enrolls less than 100 members, it's still a great bargain. To learn more, visit the essaymatters.com website and click on the green box on the right side of the homepage labeled Online Academy. If you want to enroll or maybe just have some questions, just send me an email at support at richgasway.com or give me a call at 612-548-4424. As a friendly reminder, this offer will expire at the end of the year, December 31st. Okay, let's jump into our feature segment, a flashback to my interview with Eric Dryman discussing a flashover event that if circumstances were just slightly different, it could have killed him. It was uh, Sunday, November the 14th, 2010. Um, I was a lieutenant 
this is a Lieutenant Eric Dryman. I was assigned to Ladder 19. It's my regular station assignment. Uh, typical uh, Sunday uh, shift at the firehouse. We had a few uh, alarm runs, EMS runs, things like that earlier in the day. Um, station 19 has an engine and a ladder company assigned to that firehouse. We're also one of the um, two hazardous materials um, teams for the Indianapolis Fire Department. So we also have um, two hazmat apparatus at our station that we respond with um, for hazardous materials runs. Eric, where where in the city is is Station 19? Just to, you know, if somebody is not familiar with Indianapolis and they're looking at a phase clock, mm-hmm. uh, you know, where where would it be? Okay, well, we're we're just outside of the downtown area, so we'd probably be between the six and seven. Uh, position on the clock from okay. from city center, so okay. just a little bit southwest of downtown Indianapolis. Okay, that helps. Thanks. Yeah. So engine and ladder 19 are both staffed with uh, typically staffed with four firefighters. Uh, on this particular day, due to um, some staffing issues that we had in the battalion, uh, my ladder company was only running with three, so we we call that running short uh, rather than the typical four firefighters that are assigned. We had uh, myself and uh, one of the other regular firefighters that's assigned to Ladder 19, and we had um, one firefighter that particular day who was there on overtime. So uh, normally, uh, the gentleman that was working with us that day, we don't we, we don't normally work with him, but we both uh, both myself and the other gentleman on the ladder knew him, and um, and so we had you know a relationship together. So. Um, I guess it was about uh, just a, just a few minutes before noon, 11:59. We get dispatched to a report of a residence fire at 651 Holly Avenue, which, in relationship to the firehouse, is probably well, definitely less than a half mile, uh, somewhere between a quarter and a half a mile from from the firehouse. Um, so we we get dispatched. We know we're going to be the first due uh, engine and ladder to the scene there. And as we were pulling out of the station, we, we had an obvious column of smoke in the sky, so we had a pretty good idea that something was on fire. Um, you know, at that point, we weren't sure what, but, but uh, we haven't been dispatched as a residence fire. We kind of got into that mode, assuming that we were going to pull up and uh, we were going to have a fire. So it took us about uh, two, two minutes from dispatch from the, uh, from the time the run went out to uh, arrive on the scene. And uh, Engine 19, who is housed there with us, they arrived on scene first, uh, advised they had a a one-story residence with heavy fire showing from the rear. Um, The way the house was oriented to the firehouse, the front of the the residence actually faced away from the firehouse. So as we were pulling up, we were were seeing the seaside, the rear of the residence, so we could see the heavy... uh, fire blowing out uh, the back door of the residence and a small window that looked like it um, probably belonged to a utility or a a bathroom. Um, Heavy fire 10 to 15 feet um, in the air, heavy black smoke showing from the rear. Um, There was a plug right on the corner, so engine 19 stopped and caught the hydrant, uh, laid out a three-inch supply line, which is our standard supply line for a for a residential fire uh, of this size a, a smaller bungalow type house um, as they were catching the hydrant ladder 19 proceeded past uh, engine 19 and we um, we parked in the front of the residence um, i got off the ladder and uh, completed the 360 again the the only fire that was showing uh, was was from the rear Made my way back around to the front, the A side of the residence, and the, there was a little porch on the uh, on the front of the residence. And uh, there was a an elderly lady sitting on a little bench, just like it was a she was sitting on the porch on a Sunday morning, watching the traffic go by. And uh, it, it kind of struck me as funny um, that, that she's just sitting here and her house is just uh, blazing away in the back and. So I said, ma'am, you need to get down off the porch so that we can um, go in and um, fight this fire. And um, 
I noticed it was at that point that I noticed she had two um, black streaks um, coming down from her nostrils. And at that point, it, 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 you know, the light went off and, I'm, and I realized this lady had been in there. She wasn't just sitting on the front porch unaware that her house was on fire. Um, so I asked her, I said, is there anyone else in the residence? And she said, yes, I think my son's in there. Or my, my, I think my son is still inside. So about this time, we're, my partner and I are masking up, and uh, the engine officer came up to the front porch, and his name is Lauren. I said, Lauren, I said, we're going to, she thinks her son's still inside. We're going to go ahead in and, and uh, initiate a search. <clears throat> he said, no problem. We'll be right behind you. And as we were masking up, the engine crew was stretching their their dry hand line up to the porch and getting it flaked out in the yard. I turned back to Lauren as we were um, proceeding through the door. We did, we put our face pieces on, and I said, um, I said we're going to go right uh, when you guys come in. So um, he said, all right, we'll be in right behind you. And this house had um, a uh, a storm door on the front of it with a you know full glass um, panel running the length of the, the door. And then it had a um, solid core um, wooden door on the on the interior. So when we made entry, I pushed the the wooden door open, and um, my partner Brian, I sent him to the right uh, to initiate a search, and then I proceeded in after him. And the um, the automatic closer on the on the storm door pulled the the storm door shut. So so the solid door residential door was open but you could still see out through the glass um through the storm door so brian proceeded to start initiate his search and he and i are communicating and i was a bit concerned about the volume of fire coming out of the rear of the residence um but it, but when we made entry the uh the smoke conditions were were minimal uh, maybe a foot or two off the ceiling but it's still very clear uh, you could see across the uh, the room uh, without much trouble. Um, so I'm I'm in the living room communicating with Brian as uh, as he's performing the search, um, making sure that that he's staying oriented. I'm checking the living room itself. Um, look- hey, hey, Eric. Yes. Um, with the smoke conditions like a foot off the ceiling. Yeah. Were you guys? Um, and I'm just curious. Were you standing mm-hmm. up or crawling? No, we were down. Okay, I didn't. Yeah, we, I didn't know with we the, with that light smoke condition. If you know, if you were, you were down or if you were up. Okay, go ahead. No, we were down. Okay. Um, and so Brian Brian went to the right. I I had a thermal imaging camera with me, and was periodically checking the rear the, the areas that were uh, smokier towards the rear of the residence, doing my best to to uh, search those areas with my camera to see if I could. Uh, find this uh, son that this lady had told me was in the residence. Um, about that time, I you know I started to notice. Um, first of all, I'm thinking, where's that line? Because they should be in here by now. And and it, at the same time, I, I noticed that the fire in the in the rear of the residence was was starting to intensify. And um, so I'm talking to Brian, and and he's continuing to search. I think there were um, <clears throat> there was two bedrooms. Uh, he, he had finished the first one and had started the second one. And about that time, I noticed that the heat really started to increase. Um, started to feel like you know things are getting more, um, getting close here. We don't have much time left before um, things are going to go south and we're going to have to get out of here. And the whole time I'm thinking, well, the the lines coming through the door any second because I when I when we made entry to uh, initiate our search, they were standing on the front porch with the dry line. Just uh, and the lieutenant was getting ready to call for water. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was I was kind of probably going a little bit longer in there than maybe I would have otherwise, simply because I knew that the 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 line was standing. You know, they were standing on the front porch with the line, and they should be coming through the door any second. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, as I was looking through my camera at one point, I noticed that the uh, the temperature bar on the side of the of the uh, thermal imaging camera had um, 
increased quite a bit. And, um, and then it was at that point that I started to notice the smoke conditions that they began to change. Uh, what was a relatively clear uh, environment for us to be in had, um, had gotten much smokier, uh, much hotter. And um, I, at that point, had almost made the decision that we were going to back out. And then um, I noticed my knees starting to um, get warm. And as I was looking out across the, the residence, towards the rear of the residence to uh, take a look at the fire conditions, I noticed that there were little fingers or snakes, as we call them sometimes, a flame kind of floating in the air uh, just above my head. And anyone who's ever either been in a flashover or been through the flashover chamber itself knows that's a that's a pretty ominous sign that um, you're dealing with, um, you know, an, an imminent flashover. So I, I immediately turned to, to my right and I yelled at Brian and I said, Brian, we got to go. And um, at this point, I was probably eight to ten feet away from the front door. Uh, Brian was probably a similar distance uh, to my right away from the front door. So I turned around and proceeded straight back to where I to the wall where I knew the door was. At this point, the smoke conditions had gotten to the point where I couldn't see um, see very well at all. I could I could see my hand in front of my face, you know, maybe out to a foot or two, but um, visibility had definitely diminished um, from what it was when we first made entry. And I began to sweep the wall, and for some reason, and I don't know why, probably a little bit of it was um, just my rush to get out. Um, I had difficulty locating the, the handle on the door. And um, just as I located the handle on the door, I got, I, I started to push it open and the whole room flashed over. Um, I pushed Brian out ahead of me and made sure that he got out. And then I, I essentially tumbled out on top of him. I, I landed on top of Brian. Um, and, uh, you know, fortunately, we, we both made it out. Um, the Lauren, uh, the lieutenant on the engine said that, um, when he saw that, the, the room flash just that split second before we made it, um, exit, he said he thought he had just seen, um, two of his friends die in there because he, 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 you know, he saw how bad it was. Um, we rolled out, um, I was on fire, Brian was on fire, our turnout gear, um, was, was flaming up. So the engine crew finally finally got water there was a delay um with the attack line uh getting water uh but, but once they finally got it they got it in time to uh to hose both of us down and put us out so brian and i rolled off the porch um with a few um unsavory four-letter words <laughs> as we were uh kind of regathering ourselves and i asked him i made sure he was okay i said are you okay and he said yeah i'm okay I said, are you burned anywhere? He said, no, I don't think so. So I was, I, I felt the same way, probably uh, mostly because of adrenaline at the time, um, just the whole situation itself. But uh, So we regathered ourselves, uh, picked up our hand tools, and then we proceeded to turn around and, and go back in and assist the, um, the engine crew with fighting the fire and uh, opening up areas of the, of the residence that needed opened up and then uh, continue our search. Um, ultimately, the, there was no one else in the structure. Uh, the lady's son um, had had gotten out. I'm not sure how, but he, but he had he had originally been in the residence when the fire started, um, but subsequently had exited the the structure prior to the fire department's arrival. So uh, was was he not there? You, you no, know, he was there. He was there when the fire started. No, no, was he fact, there when you guys got there? No, I mean, he was not. So he fled the scene. He had, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, he had he had fled the scene. Okay. Um, and and the, the reason that he f- fled the scene, we found out ultimately, was because um, he had a meth meth lab in the rear of the residence, and that's what that's what actually had started the fire. The, the meth lab had exploded. Um, ironically, our our engine ended up making making a run on him uh, two or three hours later when um, they got called to a, to a alley in a neighborhood near where this fire had occurred for a burned person. 
And um, so they ultimately ended up treating this gentleman for the burns that he has sustained at the at this fire. But it was uh, a few hours later. But he had um, second and third degree burns to his upper body from where he had been caught in the initial uh, flash or explosion from the from the meth lab um, lighting off. Mm -hmm. So so. So then we we ended up going back in. I noticed that my uh, my right ankle, um, I could tell that I'd gotten some steam burn or something on my right ankle because it, it was really not bothering me to the point where I couldn't function, but I, but it was annoying. I knew it was there. I was in pain on my right ankle. Um, but at the same time, you know, I've gotten minor steam burns before at, at other fires, um, you know, other little burns here and there um so I, I didn't think it was anything too significant uh so we proceeded to um finish the work that needed to be done in there um additional crews had, had subsequently arrived on the scene um we, we normally get on a residence fire in indianapolis just for a single family residence we'll get two engines and two ladders uh typically all staffed with four people so and then we get a squad company and a battalion chief and a safety officer. So, um, but by this point, there's roughly 20 people um, on the fire ground that are there to, uh, you know, deal with this situation. So, uh, once the initial fire was knocked down, um, second truck crew came in, completed the secondary search for us, um, and then my partner and I made our way out. Um, by that time, we we needed air. Our air bottles were our vibro alerts were going off on our air bottles. So went outside and it was at that point that I realized how close we had really come to, to being significantly injured, if not killed in there. I took my, my SCBA off, um, the gauge that hangs on the front of my SCBA, my, my air pressure gauge, um, the screen on it. The first thing I noticed was that it was jet black with soot. It was just completely covered. Um, I took my air pack off, laid it on the ground to change the bottle. Um, and I looked down at the base of the bottle and the gauge uh, next to the, the hand wheel for the, for the main valve for the bottle, that gauge was completely burnt away. Um, the clear, <clears throat> excuse me, the clear panel um, that you can read the pressure through um, had melted away. Um, the numbers and everything on the inside of the gauge were all burnt away. Um, my helmet, um, it was a red fire helmet when I started the day. Uh, when I came out, it, um, all the paint had been burned off of it, all the reflective trim. Um, my hood had um, pretty significant scorch marks uh, all, all around the exposed areas that weren't either up inside my helmet or down um, below my collar on my bunker coat. My face piece was melted, uh, the lens itself, the regulator. Um, and then I took my coat off. Uh, to cool down, and it was at that point when I laid my, my coat down on the ground that I had um, a hole burnt in basically where your shoulder blades are on each side of the back of my bunker coat where the uh, the fire gear had done its job, um, but the outer shell had been um, you know heated and burnt to the point where it, it, it burnt a hole through the, uh, the outer shell on both shoulders, both uh, shoulder blades. And the only thing that was basically there between me and uh, the outside environment was the uh, the inner liner and the paper barrier. So at this point, I realized that, hey, I probably need to be looked at because, you know, I started to I think the adrenaline was kind of wearing off. And I had started to to realize that uh, my ears felt funny, my neck felt funny, um, those sorts of things. So I went over to uh, one of the other firefighters on the scene and I said, how do my ears look? Because I had felt them and I didn't didn't feel you know, I didn't feel any crispy critter feeling or anything like that, but, but I didn't have, I didn't have a mirror or anything to look at him. So I asked, I asked this guy, I said, how do my ears look? And he said, oh man, he said, he said, yeah, your ears are burnt. He said, we need to get you, um, you know, you're going to need to go to the hospital. So, so I ended up getting transported and, um, and my partner that was there, he, he suffered, um, some minor burns where his, uh, turnout coat or his SCBA straps had compressed the bunker gear on, you know, on the front of his coat. Um, he, he suffered some, some contact burns there. Um, he chose not to, uh, seek, uh, 
evaluation or treatment. His were relatively minor. Um, my, my, my burns ended up being uh, secondary burns to uh, both ears, the back of my neck. Um, I had one, one spot on the uh, left side of my face where um, apparently there was a gap between my Nomex hood and uh, my face piece. I had some secondary burns there. Uh, I had burns on the back of uh, my left hand and then um, my ankle. I just had a steam burn there. But um, So I was pretty lucky. Uh, initially, they didn't know if I would need to be hospitalized uh, or how significant the burns were. Uh, we have a pretty good burn unit here in Indianapolis. And um, after evaluating me, they, they uh, opted not to hospitalize me to... Uh, cut me loose and send me back to uh, uh, to the firehouse. I uh, subsequently was sent home for the remainder of the shift um, by the, the on-duty safety officer because I had um, my burns had started to blister. Um, you know, I had bandages on both ears, those sorts of things. Obviously, it's not the kind of thing that you can um, be making runs uh, when you're in that condition. So I was essentially relieved to duty for the remainder of the day, placed on um, – um, line of duty injury and then um, my partner that was there he ended up uh, finishing out the rest of the shift and um, the other firefighter the third firefighter that was on the ladder with us uh, who was driving the ladder um, that day the way we operate is we we had we split crews so my the engineer chauffeur for the ladder his responsibilities were exterior Um, ladder company functions like horizontal ventilation, um, securing utilities, forcing the rear door if it's needed, um, laddering the structure when it's needed, those sorts of things. So he he never was inside with us during the initial search when the flashover occurred. Uh, Once his exterior duties were completed, he then came inside with us and uh, assisted us with overhaul and uh, finishing up the the primary search. So uh, he was fortunate that he wasn't in there with us. Um, cause if he had been, he, he probably would have ended up in a similar state to, uh, to Brian and myself. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you a couple questions. Uh, yeah. the time from your entry, in other mm-hmm. words, you crossed from the threshold from the outside to the inside mm-hmm. until the flashover actually occurred uh, about how long would you estimate that? Well, I've thought about that quite a bit um, over the last five plus years, and I, the best I can guess is probably between a minute and a minute and a half from the time we made entry until until the flashover occurred. Okay, so when the engine was delayed in getting water, we're not talking a five minute delay here. We're talking no. seconds to a minute. Correct. Which. Yes. In the in the scheme of getting water to a hose line is a minuscule amount of time. There was there was not some big delay here. It was just a just a minor half minute to one minute difference there. Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the the next question I have for you mm-hmm. is what. What specifically were the triggers, if you can remember, what specifically Mm -hmm. were the triggers when you guys were in there that compelled you to turn to Brian and say, we're leaving? Mm -hmm. Because you're on a search. So that's not not an easy thing to do on a search is to turn to your partner and say, um, tap him on the shoulder and say, we are now abandoning the search for the victim. And we are in full bore, save ourselves survival mode. And I'm sure you probably didn't use those words, but that's probably mm-hmm. similar to what's going through your mind. So what what was it that triggered this that that caused you to? That's a hard decision to make. That, I mean, you had to make the, like one of the toughest decisions that we make, and that is, um, it's time to save ourselves. So talk me through that. Yeah. Well, ultimately the the. The defining point for me was when I started to see those little fingers of, uh, you know, basically just a, if you can just imagine for those people who have been through the flashover chamber, they know what I'm talking about or witnessed the flashover. 
but just little strips or fingers of flame just suspended in midair, floating through the air, not attached to anything. That's basically, you know, the, the fire gases inside the structure have reached um, their ignition temperature and they're, they're spontaneously lighting off. Um, that was ultimately what, what made me decide that we needed to go. Thank you, Eric Dryman, for participating in this interview and sharing your lessons learned with our listeners and our viewers. Since 2007, SA Matters instructors have helped more than 1,200 organizations and more than 67,000 individuals improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, school bus drivers, aviation workers, oil refinery operators, and more. If you work in a high-risk, high-consequence decision-making environment, then we're here to help improve your safety and your survival and to help you accomplish the most important mission of all, and that is to go home to the ones who love you. I'd like to take a moment to honor and thank the companies, organizations, agencies, and departments that have hosted recent Situational Awareness Matters training for their team members. The Anderson County Fire Department in Anderson, South Carolina. The University Heights Fire Department in University Heights, Ohio. The International Association of Fire Chiefs Volunteer and Combination Officers Section Symposium in the Sun in Clearwater Beach, Florida. The Rogue Interagency Training Association in Medford, Oregon. The Shoreline Fire Department in Shoreline, Washington. Welcome to Chief Miller. Chief Miller operates the largest social media page dedicated to the men and women of the fire service from around the world. Check him out on Instagram at Chief underscore Miller. Find him on Twitter at Chief underscore Miller. And check out the website where you can find Chief Miller Apparel at ChiefMillerApparel.com. If you're interested in attending one of our programs, here's where we're going to be upcoming. <clears throat> where I'm at currently through December 11th, at the Sin Crude Oil Refinery in Fort McMurray, Alberta. January 3 through 9, we'll be back at the Sin Crude Oil Refinery in Fort McMurray. January 12th, at the Quad County Fire Chiefs Association in Lewiston, Idaho. January 15 and 16, at the Pearland Fire Department in Pearland, Texas. January 26th, at the Toledo Fire Department in Toledo, Ohio. February 2 and 3, the Missouri Winter Fire School in Columbia, Missouri. February 22nd, the West Virginia Emergency Services Conference in Pipestem, West Virginia. March 4 through 8, we'll be doing a North Shore tour which, in Minnesota, which will include Grand Rapids, Hibbing, Mountain Iron, and Lutzen, Minnesota. March 12th, the Maryland Fire Rescue Institute National Fire Service Staff and Command Program in Towson, Maryland. March 25 through April 3, the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard in Oahu, Hawaii. I think Rich's, Rich's ability to, to, to connect with any crowd, that's a, that's a gift that he has and, it, and it's easily transferable. This is the second or third time that I've heard him speak. There's some teeth to, to the information that he, that he brings. It's been really good. Good mixes. He knows when to throw in a joke here and there to get you back involved. Some tools. Um, I'm a new lieutenant, so very, very interesting. And some of these things I can take back to the station and use with some of the new firefighters I have my, on my crew. Something to get you thinking about your job more. Big picture type stuff. I've seen him before. A good review for sure. I have heard him before, yes. After he speaks, there's usually an enlightenment because now they're more aware of what's going on around them and what they're experiencing as they're responding to calls. He's, he's very, very knowledgeable. I'm enjoying it so far. And that intuition, that's a big one. Um, the video that you just showed up here, we're getting a lot out of this. I think this is a really good seminar, especially for new people and old. But I think it's, it's very informative. This talk gives us more ammunition to, to do all three. And they're relatable to what we have experienced or very well could experience, so it makes it easy to let the knowledge sink in. I mean, it's awesome. A lot of stories you can usually relate to yourself and, and calls you have been on, you know, aha moment. Like, he just helps you focus on picking out the right things. It's, it's awesome. It's a refresher and keeps my eyes open. It's good stuff. If people listen to the message that he has, it's an incredible message delivered by a very com compassionate person strategy and tactics are going to always change 
situation awareness is it doesn't change. You're all, it's always there. He's got some good stories to tell, and he's very thorough with his stories, and it's uh, interesting listening to him. Very clear speaker, and he, he talks um, on our level because he's been there, he's been in the trenches. I think he's doing well, and I'm looking forward to the second half. To see the locations of all the upcoming events, just head over to the SA Matters website and click on the blue box on the right side of the homepage labeled Live Training Dates. If you're interested in hosting a program, just click on the Contact Us tab at the top of the SA Matters homepage and I'll give you a call. If you want to become part of the SA Matters community of learners, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Just check the show notes for how to get connected with us through our newsletter membership podcast subscribers, YouTube subscribers, and how to follow us on the social media channels of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. There we share ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 241 of the SA Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guest, Eric Dryman, for sharing your story and your lessons learned to help us be safer. Thank you to our awesome sponsors, Midwest Fire and Chief Miller. Thank you to all those companies, agencies, and organizations that have hosted Situational Awareness Matters training programs. Thank you to all the organizations that have hosted a live, virtual, internet-based training event. Thank you to the more than 2,500 students and graduates of the highly acclaimed Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy. Remember that special enrollment for the Academy ends on December 31st. And most importantly, thank you, the listeners and the viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.